You may recall that recently we had Jack from Missouri Drone Deer Recovery down to look at deer numbers and also where deer were on our property during the rainy morning. Man, I learned a lot and we had a lot of great feedback from that. And a lot of people said, hey, we want Jack to come back. What would happen if Jack was flying and we did a fire? So we had about a 30 acre fire scheduled. Jack had a hole in his busy schedule. He's usually out treating or flying other people's property and he came down and joined us. And it was really interesting from several points of view. So Jack got here early in the morning, way before a fire would carry, and we flew the entire area just to kind of get him oriented to where the fire would be and also see what critters were in the area. And it wasn't long until he spotted a deer or his drone spotted a deer in the unit where we're going to burn. Doing a little browsing on stuff that had grown and our hopes is with the prescribed fire, we could even improve that browse quality and attract more deer to the area. It's really important to know that one of the first steps to conducting a prescribed fire is having a great fire break and way that the fire is going to stop. That may be a road or a creek or a food plot. In our case, this was going through a bunch of timber, so we went in with backpack blowers and steel chainsaws and created that fire line. This wasn't made by a dozer, it was made by hand tools. And where we did not have a road, we just simply created a fire line. You're probably gonna notice in the unit and on some of the edges there's some standing cedars. Well, there's a food plot kind of at the top middle of the unit. And we left a pretty thin buffer of standing cedars around just as a visual screen so we could get in and out of that plot without alerting deer off the sides. Probably wasn't necessary in hindsight because the land slopes off very steeply around both sides, but it has helped us have tree stands at multiple locations around the plot. Always want to have a burn plan before you light a fire. In this case, we had a wind out of the north. That's kind of up where the food plot is, going way down towards the valley. And the humidity was a bit higher than we like, about 50%. But it was getting late in the year, and I wanted to get some acres burned. So the wind was going to gust pretty strong, but the fuel was just not that flammable. You probably see lightning in some of the leaves. It's not taking off. Even though I was lighting at a little bit lower elevation than the top, which would create a head fire, the flame height was six inches, maybe a foot tall, just easing up through there. Now, once I got on top, there's an area that had been cleared long ago with some native grasses. And when I touched that off, that fire went. Those grasses, dead grasses, will dry out much quicker than even leaves on the ground. And it's gonna carry a fire much better. In addition, it was right on top of the hill and a lot of wind was feeding that fire. One of the great things about the thermal is you can see that fire and even little embers or sparks coming off there. Remember we said this was a north wind and we started top, so we're burning with the wind and when I hit that grassy spot, the thermal really shows it throwing embers or sparks off. That's blowing into the unit. If we'd have started the other way, it's possible that could have blown across our fire line and started what's now called a wildfire, a fire in an area that we weren't prepared to burn. So knowing the wind direction and the fuel conditions in relation to that fire line or your fire break is critical in every single prescribed fire. The thermal illustrated this to me better than ever before and I've been burning since I was in college and worked for the Bureau of Land Management out west. The thermal turned out to be an excellent way for me to understand fire behavior even more. You notice that head fire through the grass didn't take long at all. This were some bald spots and skips where there wasn't fuel, but even with the wind blowing, it was just jumping across those three to five foot bare ground areas and igniting the next clump of grass. But once we get past that grass and you can see in the leaves, fire's just kind of barely cooking along, not near as fast. Fuel types are very important to the intensity and movement of the fire. You notice a lot of smoke's coming up, and that's partially because the humidity level's a bit higher. There's a lot of moisture. It's a lighter colored smoke. A real dark smoke would be a different type of fuel. It's a light colored smoke, and we can see that the smoke is all blowing towards the south or away from where we're lighting it. That would normally be considered a head fire, 
but we're starting to slope downhill. So the fire's not carrying very quick. And Daniel and I knew we'd have to go around the outside edges of the fire, what's called a ring fire, to get it to carry back up the hill. Again, with the thermal drone, it's really easy to see that when I do light a head fire, the wind is pushing it and it is going uphill. Well, that heat is rising and preheating the fuel. It's drying out some moisture in that fuel. And you can tell from that heat signature, it's cooking all along better. Where a backing fire, the heat is not preheating the fuel and it's much more difficult to ignite and it doesn't burn near as intensely. We get a lot of questions about the temperature of the fire, and you can see right here, again, with Jack's thermal drone technology that on the fire hotspot was 320 up to 950 degrees, and about 28 degrees or so, it was chilly morning where the fire wasn't burning. Now, you can damage a tree. You can get the heat through the bark and damage a tree at about 160 degrees, depending on the tree, the type of bark, the thickness of bark. So and how many minutes it's on the tree. So a head fire moves past the tree quicker. A backing fire is a lower heat level, but it stays in one place longer because it's moving slower. And again, learning all these things allows us to design our fire plan to accomplish our mission. What size trees we're going to potentially harm or kill and which ones where the fire's just going by and the tree doesn't even know it was there. Growing Deer is brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. Also by Green Cover Food Plots, Winchester, PH Outdoors, Moultrie Mobile, Steel, Fleet Outdoor Apparel, Morel Targets, Fourth Arrow, Scorpion Venom Archery, Case IH Tractors, Ward Laboratories, Burris Optics, G5 Broadheads, Prime Bows, and Redneck Hunting Blinds. We're not right at the edge of the unit here, but this is a really important point I want to share, that when you light fire in multiple places within the unit, and they're close to burning together, those fires are actually competing for resources. Fuel and oxygen is part of the fuel. And you see this burning close together, all of a sudden it's going to start swirling and throwing embers in different directions. Got to be careful when you're doing a ring fire or lighting fire in different areas, and they come together. Where those two fires meet, or even before, right before they meet, it's often very intense, flame height will be much taller, creating this little micro weather right there, and it could throw embers a long ways, even across to an area you did not want to burn. We study weather forecasts intensely before a fire, even you know during the fire, and we knew that there was gonna be a wind shift, or at least one was forecast this day, out of north, going almost halfway around the compass to out of the south. So we timed it where we get the north side of fire blacked out. That big black line makes your fire line, you know, 50, 100 yards wide. It's not gonna blow over that. And then we started working down the edges as the wind was shifting. So when we got to the bottom of this area where we'd cut all the cedars and there was a bunch of hardwood saplings going in, we could attempt to push a head fire with that southern wind now up through there to get a better kill of those hardwoods. By this time of morning, the wind is starting to shift, but we've already blacked out the whole northern portion of this unit, and Daniel and I, he's on the east side, I'm on the west side, start working down toward the south in the unit. And there's some mature hardwoods in there where you have a, a, a fire break much bigger than the area where all the cedars are cut and we really want to burn. And we have to be careful because the wind's shifting, so we're doing what's called strip head fires. Every five, 10, 20, 30 yards, we're lighting a fire and we determine how far we are from one fire line that's already burning to the next one by the amount of fuel, the quality of trees. We don't want to you know, scar up a great big beautiful white oak. If it's all little hickories or something, maybe we take a bigger bite. We walk downhill 20, 30, 40 yards, trying to put more heat on trees that aren't as desirable. So a strip head fire is a way to really use that drip torch as your paintbrush and you're painting the future canvas of the habitat in that area. This is a great clip. We always have people watching our back line and I spend a lot of time, you know, lighting, walking back, checking my back line. And one of the dangers I'm looking for is you've got a snag that catches on fire and you just kept going forward. You might not know it and that could start burning, you know, 
way up in the tree, that tree could literally fall across the fire line or get in the wind, blow embers across the fire line. Before that tree gets totally engulfed and it's really hot, we're going to take our steel chainsaw, the right personal protection gear, you know, a helmet, chaps, glasses, whatever, and fell that snag into the unit. We don't want that tree cooking all night long. Wind gets really strong or the next day and blows it across the fire line and again starts a wildfire, an uncontrolled fire. So it's really important to fail snags. And one thing I've learned is using these really high quality battery powered chainsaws that always start instantly. You're not fighting anything. When you need to cut that snag down and get it down, you hit the button, that saw starts off plenty strong to, and enough battery to fail several snags on a fire. Daniel and I have now worked almost all the way together around this 30 plus acre fire. And there's some grass at the bottom because all the cedars were felled and got more sun to the ground. So we're gonna light this grass and try to get enough heat or momentum going uphill again to kill those hardwood saplings. And grass is one of the most flammable or volatile fuels. It dry grass carries fire really easy. And of course a green growing grass field wouldn't carry fire at all because of moisture content. So we've timed this fire to be late in the dormant season. Grasses are just starting to green up. They're still dry enough to really carry that fire, which was our plan because coincided with that timing is the saplings have some moisture coming up in them. And when they're full of moisture, it doesn't take as much heat to rupture the cells right inside of the bark and at least top kill that sapling. We're in the Ozark Mountains and when people come to see the Proven Grounds too, they always say, oh my gosh, this is much steeper than I thought it was. That's because 2D doesn't show it like 3D would, a 3D model. So here there's a lot of one, two, three, even four foot rock bluffs. I mean, just really rock bluffs. And there's not enough fuel for that fire to be intense enough to jump above that bluff. Oftentimes it burns up that bluff and goes out. So Daniel and I spent a lot of time out in the unit, walking the edge of those bluffs. We're on top of the bluff, but right by the edge, lighting it, and that fire would burn to the next rock bluff, then we'd have to hop up and light another one. And that's again out in the unit where we'd cut a lot of cedars and trying to burn up those cedar skeletons, release those nutrients back to the soil, and keep all those hardwood saplings that have sprouted at bay so we can grow high quality grasses and forbs. You probably see all these big old cedar skeletons out there. Some people think they're ugly. My wife thinks they're ugly. They could serve a couple of purpose. They probably keep some deer from getting their nose all the way in there and eating the best quality native vegetation so you get some seed production out of that. But they are big and you notice the fire's just burning underneath them. They're dry, they're, they're wicked dry, but there's not enough flame ice here or enough heat at one place long enough to cause most of those cedar skeletons to ignite. They're going to be there a long time. It freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw, gets more cracks in there and they start breaking down. Because my wife really doesn't like that, and it makes it a little more difficult to hunt those areas, right? You got limited visibility. We now pay the crew we use to slash those every four feet, get them down on the ground, cut them up every four feet. That lets those logs dry out much more. And when you slash uh, the cedars, you will get much better consumption just to first fire through. We can clearly see now that we've ignited all the way around the fire. Those edges again got a little more sunshine, a little more grass, so it's easy to see the heat all the way around the edge. We're gonna let that burn. It's gonna be pretty fast and hot. Once that cools off just a little bit, Daniel and I go in the fire unit. There's big rocky areas and bare areas where it's totally safe. It would not burn no matter what happened. And we're lighting those pockets of fuel in the fire to get as much consumption and set back as many of hardwood saplings as we can. I would not do this in the middle of a big native grass field or a bunch of big pine straw. You don't want to be in the middle of the unit because you don't really have an escape route. But here, there's so many areas of just bare rock that we were never more than a few steps away from a safe area.
Jack picked up a great shot of a stump or log burning and it's hot and tense, you know, and it's gonna burn for a long time. That's something we're always watching for. And while conditions are good, we want that to consume as much of, of the wood as it will. That's just releasing nutrients back to the soil for better quality crops, if you will, and native grasses and forbs to grow. But we keep an eye on that because before we leave the fire, we wanna put that out. So we call those smokers. And what I really learned, that used to take a lot of walking to find those, but with the thermal drone picking up that heat imprint, the drone saved us a lot of steps by being able to check everything out, especially at the end of the day. And you see there's a few hot spots out there, stumps or logs burning, but they're way in the fire. We've got them on the ground. If they were, you know, something standing, we've cut those down, they're on the ground. They're way in the unit. There's just no chance the wind's gonna blow fire or embers from that across our line. As a follow-up to our fire, our job is not done that day. We do it a little different in some crews out there. The next morning, we're wait till about nine or 10 a.m. You know, sun's up. If there's something that maybe smoldered all night, it's flaring up by then. And we're walk the unit, certainly all the perimeter of the unit, but out in the unit too, looking for what we call smokers that we need to put out before we consider that fire completely finished. Like most things in life, new technology can be used for good or bad. And in this case, boy, the thermal drone was awesome. It allowed us more control, more knowledge of the fire base, allowed us to adjust our intensity to fire where we needed to, to accomplish our objectives and make sure that fire was safe during the mop up period. Learning new techniques is a great way to enjoy creation, but even more important than learning techniques is to go back to that old book. Some people call it old, I call it living alive, the Bible. Read it daily, seek the Creator's will, and apply it to our lives. Thanks for watching, Growing Deer.